Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, a win for temporary workers. A new law protecting against low pay and unsafe working conditions takes effect for thousands of temporary workers in New Jersey. When the workers have stability, security, safety, and dignity and benefits and protections that we provide, they become loyal, dependable, and productive employees in return. Also, revitalizing Journal Square, a multi-million dollar French art museum is slated to open in 2026, but some GOP lawmakers are calling it a circus of excess and waste. I, I mean, I just find this to be nothing but the absolute worst in pork spending, and it needs to be exposed. Also, equity in education. They're going to get exactly what they need based on their gender, their race, or other aspects of their identity. The state's Board of Education narrowly approves the use of gender-neutral terms in schools, and parent groups are threatening to sue. Plus, Chasing the Dream, a formerly abandoned lot in Camden, is transformed into new homes for first-time buyers. So you'll be able to take care of your house, take care of your property, and do these streets the way they used to do 50 years ago. NJ Spotlight News starts right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together and Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Joanna Gagas, in for Brianna Venosi. The Temporary Workers' Bill of Rights went into full effect this weekend, providing a number of protections for some of the most vulnerable workers in our state, offering increased pay, eliminating fees that workers can be charged, and allowing temporary workers to accept permanent positions. Just a few of the changes. The law's passage faced countless hurdles, and even now that it's been enacted, it faces a legal challenge from the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. But as senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, that's not stopping advocacy groups from pounding the pavement today to let workers know of their new rights under this new law. Advocates chanted, we did it, celebrating the brand new Temp Workers Bill of Rights that takes effect this week. The president setting law guarantees protection against low pay and unsafe working conditions for hundreds of thousands of folks across New Jersey who get hired through staffing agencies, but often fear retaliation for complaining about routine abuse on the job. Yolanda Hunka explained through a translator. Nos hemos sentido menos Even if they didn't need you to work that day, they could bring you out to the warehouse and leave you there stranded. We felt belittled. We felt like we have no worth, no value, even though we're fighting for dignity at our work. Pro-labor groups like Make the Road and New Labor pushed hard against powerful business lobbies to pass the bill, and Governor Murphy signed it earlier this year. Advocates handed out leaflets early this morning in Elizabeth. I just say to the people that don't be scared, don't feel fear, because we are organizations that are giving information, know your rights, and you're going to be fine. We've been out since 6 a.m. talking with temp workers up and down Elizabeth Avenue and across the city to inform them of the new law and their rights. The Bill of Rights mandates temp workers must receive pay and benefits equal with the average full-time employee's compensation, can accept permanent jobs without interference from staffing agencies, cannot be charged transportation or uniform fees, and must be paid if they're called into work, even if there's nothing for them to do. But as it takes effect, some businesses are calling the law untenable. The average pay component really could lead to, you know, temps making more money than say the entry level employee, as well as having to pay out the cash equivalent of benefits. New Jersey's Business and Industry Association and Jersey Staffing Alliance has sued to block it, but a federal judge let the law take effect while the matters decided at trial. I've spoken with some staffing companies that are saying they're already losing a ton of contracts that some of their temps have been laid off. When the workers have stability, security, safety, and dignity and benefits and protections that we provide, 
they become loyal, dependable, and productive employees in return. New Jersey's Labor Commissioner predicts this law will help grow the economy and insists his department has a robust staff of investigators ready to enforce regulations. Even though New Jersey's passed a slew of new worker protection mandates, he expects compliance. Very few people are out there looking to break the law every day. Uh, and especially in this tight labor market where workers are such a high commodity, uh, employers are desperate for workers. Advocates will be out every day this week to inform temps of their rights under the new law. They urge folks with questions to text the word temp to 52886. In Elizabeth, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. We've reported on the controversy surrounding the final days of budget negotiations, most notably all of those last minute add ons to the budget that are largely done without oversight. Lawmakers call them pork barrel spending or Christmas tree items. One of those so-called Christmas tree items, funding for the new Centre Pompidou Museum in Jersey City, touted as a world-class, one-of-a-kind destination for the entire country to experience. But Republican lawmakers are crying foul, calling the museum the poster child for wasteful spending. Senior political correspondent David Cruz spoke to Jersey City's Mayor Stephen Fulop, who doesn't hold back in defending the museum plans. It is still chic in some circles to look down at the French, and when South Jersey State Senator Mike Testa refers to the Pompidou X project in Jersey City as the French Museum, it's not a compliment. The much ballyhooed but locally criticized and for the last couple of years now state subsidized project has turned into an objet de gassement for Testa, who says he's got nothing against the French or even art for art's sake. What I do have something against is wasteful spending. You know, we were originally told that this French museum was going to cost taxpayers of the state of New Jersey approximately $24 million. Now we're already seeing ballooning costs of $58 million. And the Department of State is telling us that what I think is going to be an absolute boondoggle is going to cost us approximately $200 million. Testa sits on the Senate Budget Committee, from which he has launched criticism of Democratic spending, particularly on the so-called Christmas tree items like this one, that make it into the state budget in the haze of the 11th hour. He commissioned a report from the Republican Senate office that blasted Pompidou X as a waste of taxpayer subsidy. Some of it, the report says, indirectly washing back into campaign coffers and entities that otherwise promote office holders supporting the project. Mike Testa is either ignorant or a liar. Mayor Steve Fulop, a Democratic gubernatorial candidate, says the report is a work of abstract art masquerading as realism. He says Testa, a potential Republican candidate for governor, has pulled numbers out of thin air and made claims that are simply untrue. Is it a $200 million project? And how no, much look, has the state contributed so far? So, I mean, that's a public record, what the state contributed. I, I believe that the state has contributed in the range of $48 million, okay? The entire project um, will be similar to construction projects of that size that are destinations. You are building a world-class museum. There's none like it in New Jersey, a major destination for the entire region. And if that costs $200 million or more, Phillips says that's okay with him because the return in economic activity will far exceed that. Testa says if that's true, then the project and other late budget additions like it should be okay with a little more state oversight something that resonates with some local residents who've given side eye to the project from the beginning. It shouldn't take a South Jersey uh, politician to uh, ask about these uh, types of things. I think the city council is going to have to inquire about Jersey City's commitment and what did that look like? Who are we paying money to? Um, you know, just having that oversight. It's a franchise agreement, not any different than McDonald's or Burger King or anything like that. They're licensing the name, they're providing management and support, but they're not gonna pay for operating costs just like a, a franchise would. It's a partnership, and a partnership means that we benefit and they benefit, me and the Sancho Pompidou, and I'm okay with that, as long as it's fair. For all the excitement being generated by this project, it's still years away. 
Even the mayor admitted recently that opening day has been pushed back to 2026, well after he's out of office here. In Jersey City, I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. While many school board meetings around the state have become the epicenter of culture wars lately, last week we saw the state's Board of Education make changes to the equity standards that govern all school districts. And no surprise, it's been met with resistance from parents' rights groups and some Democratic leaders who say the state Board of Ed may have gone too far in its language. Now, two Republican lawmakers say they'll introduce legislation to repeal the ruling. I'm joined now by our education and child welfare reporter, Hannah Grove who was at the Board of Ed meeting. So, Hannah, the State Board of Ed just narrowly approved these changes to the state's equity code, and we, we've seen pushback from it. What can you tell us just first about the changes that were made? Yeah, so one of the biggest changes is moving the language to from equality to focusing on equity. And so that means instead of providing students across the board the same thing, they're going to get exactly what they need based on their gender, their race, or other aspects of their identity. And yet at the same time, we're seeing some of the language being removed, right? Some of the gender-specific language being removed. Explain that. Yeah, so in certain instances, the code used to refer to male or female students, or instead of saying the commissioner, they used his or her, so gendered pronouns. And in the new version of the code that was just adopted, it's gender neutral. So it would say the commissioner, or instead of discussing sex and two sexes, it might say all sexes or on the basis of gender as opposed to for male and female. We are seeing parent pushback on um, parental rights groups that have been very active and vocal in local school district board meetings. We're pretty equally vocal here. Um, pushing back against these changes. What now are we seeing from them and, and what are some of the threats that they've made? Yeah, so the room was packed at the State Board of Ed. There was more than 40 advocates, a lot of them members of a group called Team PYC or Protect Your Children, which is a parental rights group across New Jersey. And so they were particularly taking issue with the switch to the gender neutral language and what that might mean for health classes or classes that deal with human sexuality where students might be separated on the basis of gender as opposed to how it used to say in the code on the basis of sex. And that's not a requirement. It says that schools may choose to do that. And so as soon as the code was adopted, people were very angry. They were shouting at the board and they were also threatening a lawsuit. So they're threatening to sue the state here? Yes. Uh, again, we should reiterate these uh, this equity change applies to all school districts across the state. Some of those parent groups have pushed for local control, right? Yes. And so in many instances, especially with the human sexuality classes, that would be up to the district to decide what they want to do. It's up to them if they're going to keep students all together, regardless of their gender, or if they're going to separate on the basis of gender. And just help us understand the timeline. We know that some Democratic leaders, including Senators Lagana and Gopal, pushed back on some language that came out of the meeting, including potential sanctions for school districts that don't adopt these rules in time. The, le the legislators saying that is not the role of the State Board of Ed, but just explain the timing and the changes that schools have to adhere to. Yeah, so the code goes up for readoption every seven years, and now that it's been reapproved, the changes should take effect within a month once it's posted to the New Jersey Register. And so one of the things mentioned in the code is that there's a comprehensive equity plan that districts need to implement to ensure there's equitable opportunities for students in their schools. They have to come up with that every three years. Once they come up with it, according to the old code, they had 180 days to implement it once approved. The new code shortens that timeline to 60 days, which some of the members on the board were saying is too short. Thank you so much. Really informative. We're going to be watching to see what happens as a result of, of what came out of this vote. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Well, it's day four of a major nurses' strike at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital in New Brunswick, where 1,700 nurses walked off the job on Friday and continued picketing throughout the weekend and today. The nurses are fighting for better staffing levels and increased paid sick days, which they say will make the hospital safer for both the nurses and patients. Meanwhile, the hospital 
Hospital, which is an underwriter of NJ Spotlight News, released a statement saying it remains open, fully operational, and completely staffed thanks to the support of our highly skilled, highly trained, and professional replacement nurses. The hospital assuring that staffing levels have been appropriately maintained across all units and shifts. There is no word yet as to when contract negotiations between the hospital and the nurses' union will resume. The state's launching a new website today, stopoverdoses.nj.gov, where residents can find pharmacies that hand out naloxone, the drug that reverses an opioid overdose. The website is part of Governor Murphy's Naloxone 365 initiative that provides free naloxone anonymously to anyone age 14 and older. So far, more than 40,000 naloxone doses have been distributed, and this new website will show where each of the 610 participating pharmacies are located. Meanwhile, a new partnership is launching between Hackensack Meridian Health, Hikma Pharmaceuticals, and the nonprofit Dispensary of Hope to bring naloxone to even more people. I'm joined now by Hackensack's Dr. Akash Shah to talk more about it. Dr. Shah, great to have you with us. Uh, tell us about this take-home naloxone program and how it works. Sure. Well, the important thing to understand is that we are in the midst of an overdose crisis, and so our goal through this program is to prevent as many overdoses as possible. So if you're a patient at Jersey Shore University Medical Center, we have addiction specialists who will see you at the bedside, give you the care you need, and before you go, we'll put Plexato, an overdose rescue agent, in your hand at no cost at the point of discharge. Why are, so there's a collaboration here. I want to better understand why collaborations like this are so critical. You have a pharmaceutical company, you have a hospital and you have a nonprofit all working together. Explain what that looks like and why it's an important piece. Yeah, well, at its core, Joanna, it's because this crisis is bigger than any one of us, right? It takes a village to turn the tide against the overdose crisis, and that's why Hikma Pharmaceuticals, Hackensack Meridian Health, and the Dispensary of Hope are coming together to do this and meet patients where they're at and save life after life after life in our community. Explain just a little bit more how that collaboration works and how you're all coordinating to reach people who need this life-saving treatment more and easier. Uh, absolutely. So the way in which we're coordinating is Hikma Pharmaceuticals is donating the medication to the Dispensary of Hope, which we already have a collaboration with. The Dispensary of Hope operates across our network, providing nearly a million dollars worth of medications at no charge in the hands of patients, medications like insulin, and now, because of this partnership, medications like Cluxata. I'm sure you're aware the state recently launched its own program um, to try to get naloxone into the hands of folks using pharmacies. Do you believe that there's, uh, let me ask it to you this way, is there enough, are there enough pharmacies per participating? Do we need more uh, partnerships that look like this? Is this something that can be scaled around the state just to, to get naloxone into the hands of more people? Yeah, well, I, I certainly think we don't have enough naloxone in the hands of those in need. And we recognize that while having being able to get it at pharmacies is a great step, not everyone makes it from the hospital door to the pharmacy steps. And so that's why we are making sure that it's in the hands of our patients before they even leave the hospital door. So this is a pilot program. What is the future of this program? At what point do you decide this is something that will remain, that, that is needed to remain? Yeah, well, that's for, for folks far smarter than me to understand. But I'll tell you this, knowing those folks, I have no doubt that if the data shows this is making the impact we firmly believe it will, then I have no doubt that we'll see more of this in the future. Dr. Akash Shah, Chief of Addiction Services at Hackensack Meridian Health. Thank you so much. Thank you. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, four new wind farm projects could be coming to New Jersey after proposals were submitted to the state on Friday. Information was released about three out of the four proposals, which come from a combination of U.S. and European-based companies. And while some conservative groups have pushed back against wind farms, saying they disrupt scenic views along the Jersey Shore, two of the new proposals would place wind turbines beyond the view of the coast, 37 miles out to sea. That's twice as far as some of the projects that have already been approved by the state. If all four projects are approved, it would more than double the wind energy planned for New Jersey, and just two of those projects could power one and a half million homes. Turning to Wall Street, the market started the week strong. Here's a look at how the trading numbers closed for the day. 
Support for the Business Report provided by the Chamber of Commerce, Southern New Jersey. Working for economic prosperity by uniting business and community leaders for 150 years. Membership and event information online at chambersnj.com. What once stood as an abandoned lot in Camden is now being transformed into a group of affordable homes for Camden residents. The project, a collaboration between several groups in Camden, will build nine new homes and renovate one house that will all be available for purchase for first-time homebuyers in Camden. Raven Santana has more on the project as part of our ongoing series, Chasing the Dream, focusing on poverty, justice, and economic opportunity. Empire Avenue in Camden was once an abandoned lot, but new construction is transforming parts of the city. And so what you see behind me today is a represent representation of four homes as a part of a 10 new homes project with more development to come down the pike. Bridget Pfeiffer is CEO of Parkside Business and Community in partnership. The nonprofit community building initiative is deeply rooted in the vision of residents who Pfeiffer credits in their most recent affordable development. The residents went through a very rigorous like two and a half actually four year two phased neighborhood planning process and at the core of that plan was this idea that we needed to create housing. Housing that is affordable to all. Pfeiffer says the three bedroom two bath homes with modern finishes will be sold for $129,000 once construction is completed. Staff says the goal is to encourage residents to own, not rent. Get people to get some home ownership, not rental, home ownership. Own your house so you'll be able to take care of your house, take care of your property, and do these streets the way they used to do 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when neighbors took care of their block. People like me, who never understood that home ownership is attainable, would not have been able to purchase. So that is definitely critical, and I'm so happy because so many of our neighbors, our friends, our families are in dire need to be able to buy something that, you know, will grow wealth for their family. A number of funders who were at the event to celebrate the new affordable housing shared why community partnerships on projects like this will only continue to expand. New Jersey American Water has been serving Kramer Hill and East Camden since 1891. The fact that we provided the NRTC grant that helped to some degree to drive a program like this, to be able to see our dollars go directly into the community and help is incredibly important to us because as a water utility, we feel uniquely oriented to be part of a community. We enter folks' homes every day and we provide them with a life-sustaining utility. So it's really important for us to, to have those trusted partnerships. This is unique. This is different. And, um, you know, and I know that it's for first-time home buyer, right? And, and uh, so it's, it's good. Uh, and we want to let people know throughout the city that there's still hope. You know, we believe in affordable housing. Um, you know, we believe also in market rate housing, but we have people who are in need. A need that Assemblyman William Spearman says will be met. The budget this year and last year, we've fully, we've been putting money back into the housing trust fund at DCA, which provides the funding for subsidies for projects like this. And that's something that the governor and the, um, and the legislature has been committed to because let's face it, we have to rebuild our communities. And rebuilding will continue as PBCIP was recently approved for a final site plan for new townhomes on Haddon Avenue that will be ready to be sold next March. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. Well, New Jersey is now the last state in the nation that's forbidden from pumping our own gas. We were among the last two in the country, but on Friday, Oregon passed a law allowing its drivers to choose whether they want to pump it themselves or take the help of a gas station attendant. Here in New Jersey, it's been illegal for drivers to pump their own gas since 1949. And while some of you are just itching to get out there and do it yourself, especially when you're in a rush, well, according to a Rutgers Eagleton poll last year, it seems the majority of Jersey drivers are perfectly content to let someone pump their gas for them. You can count me among them. That's going to do it for us tonight, but a reminder to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen anytime. I'm Joanna Gagas for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. 
NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. Major funding for Chasing the Dream is provided by the JPB Foundation with additional funding from the Peter G. Peterson and Joan Gans Cooney Fund. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com. NJM Insurance Group has been serving New Jersey businesses for over a century. As part of the Garden State, we help companies keep their vehicles on the road, employees on the job, and projects on track. Working to protect employees from illness and injury, to keep goods and services moving across the state. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. If you need to see a doctor, RWJ Barnabas Health has two easy ways to do it from anywhere. You can see an urgent care provider 24-7 on any device with our Telemed app. Or use our website to book a virtual visit with an RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group provider or specialist, even as a new patient. You've taken every precaution, and so have we. So don't delay your care any longer. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.